Um, welcome and thanks for joining us today for our event, Period Costume Design Through the Lens of Bridgerton. My name is Susan Mickey and I'm the director of the School of Theater here in the College of Fine Arts at Boston University. I'm a professional costume designer and an educator and I'm looking forward to sharing this hour with you all and welcoming you into our costume world. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and the College of Fine Arts and the School of Theater. We have just a few housekeeping notes before we get started for everyone. We'd like to thank um, Evan Petro. He's an MFA candidate in costume design. It was Evan who first initiated and organized this panel. So thank you, Evan. We really appreciate that. Um, today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association webpage. So you can look for it there. Our panelists today are very eager to answer your questions and you may um, leave them in the Q&A box. And our um, moderator that is under the guise of the BU Alumni Relations sign there, Tracy Riccardi, who we're so grateful to, will um, help us curate and read out those questions as they come in. If you do not see a Q&A box, just hover your cursor over your screen, either at the bottom of the screen or the top panel, and it should drop in as um, Q&A. Um, there'll be a, um, you can select the Q&A and type in your question there. We'd like to encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation because we're hoping this is more of a conversation with each other than um, just a lecture. Um, Tracy, thank you so much uh, for getting us together and for um, keeping track of the questions and calling them to our attention. So keep the, keep the conversation rolling, I would say. We have four amazing panelists today and I'm thrilled to introduce them to you. They're four of my absolute favorite people. And um, the first is Mara Blumenfeld. Mara, wave to us. You are, she is a costume designer. And this semester, we are very lucky to have her teaching at the School of Theater. Her work is focused primarily on theater, opera, and dance. She's an ensemble member of the Looking Glass Theater Company where she has designed over 35 productions. She designed Mary Zimmerman's off-Broadway and Broadway productions of Metamorphosis, as well as many operas for her um, at the Metropolitan Opera. Her international credits include productions for the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Canada. She's done uh, productions in Tokyo, London, Australia, and in Milan, Italy at the Elegant La Scala. In 2012, she won the Michael Merritt Award for Excellence in Design and Collaboration and is a four-time winner of Chicago's Joseph Jefferson Award for Costume Design. Then we have Nancy Leary. Nancy, say hello. Nancy is an alum of the School of Theater in the College of Fine Arts and an assistant professor in costume design and production. She's a costume designer whose visionary work for opera and theater spans several decades and has graced stages across the United States and Europe. Recent awards and recognition, recognitions include an Ernie for costume design for Into the Woods at New Repertory Theater, an Elliot Norton for her contribution to the production of Permanent Collection and a nomination for Best Production of Twelfth Night with the Commonwealth Shakespeare Company. In 2016, Nancy's designs for the Magic Flute were displayed at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts alongside set and costume designs by William Kentridge, Chagall and Julie Taymor. Her costumes for The Ghost of Versailles for Glimmerglass Opera with director Jay Lessinger traveled to France and performed with the Opera Royale Chateau de Versailles at Versailles. So that's one of the most um, amazing places to take costumes I can imagine. Our third panelist is Penny Panette. Penny, give us a wave. An alumni of the School of Theater and the College of Fine Arts and BU manager of our costume studio. She grew up in the untamed woods of Maine where I believe she's coming to us from today where she spent hours studying the shapes and colors of nature, creating clothes for leading ladies, starlets, ingenues and dancers. 
yielded an understanding of how to make flattering forms functional. She was a draper for Huntington Theater Company and also supervised the costume shop at Tufts University. Pitt Penny is a master craftsperson and artisan as well as a designer with a keen eye and a talent for realizing beautiful costume creations. And last but certainly not least, Mary Ann Verhan. Give us a wave, Mary Ann. Associate Professor of Costume Design at the School of Theater. She has designed for the Huntington Theater uh, since its premiere season. Her New York credits include designing the Broadway production of Peter Pan, um, work at the Public Theater, the New York Theater Company, Second Stage, and Hudson Guild. She designed costumes for cruise ships. She's done television commercials. She's done TV and everything in between. Her awards include two Ernie's, a Susie Bass Award, the New York City Village Downtowner Theater Award, and a Jeff. She has a Distinguished Achievement Award from her high school and her undergraduate school, St. Nor Norbert College. We welcome all of you and we look forward to spending this time today together. So, introductions out of the way. We have all, I think, binged on the Netflix original Bridgerton created by Chris Van Dusen, uh, executive produced by the TV legend Shonda Rhimes and adapted from Julia Quinn's um, best-selling Bridgerton novels. We thought it would be fun to get together today and uh, to talk a little bit about these uh, well-known, with these well-known and successful designers who I just introduced and uh, have them talk about their approach to clothing in this same time period for multiple productions across the, the country. So we're gonna use bridge, the, the era of Bridgerton as a pillar for this, and we'll refer to it more in the second, the latter part of this talk. But we'd like to start with just the general um, process of costume design. So when starting a production or project, what is the very first step you take in the process? And I'm gonna first ask Mara Blumenfeld to tell us about that. Thanks, Susan. Um, well, the first step usually for me is to read the script. And in the case of if you're doing an adaptation like a Jane Austen, uh, reading the source material um, and just getting, you know, getting immersed in the world of the writing and of the play. Um, and then the next thing you do is really dive pretty heavily into research and that can take any number of forms that can be looking at um, fashion illustrations of the period, looking at painting, portraiture, sculpture, uh, looking at websites, of, for example, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art has an amazing collection of extant garments. So it's really just immersing yourself in the world and really starting to look at the silhouette and the line and what makes that period recognizable. Thank you so much. That's great, Mara. Um, uh, Mary Ann, why don't you tell us a little bit about your process? Well, obviously, I do the same thing as Mara. Um, I do break one one rule, which is that I I believe you should like read the script first and then dig into it. I actually, when I'm reading a script the first time, I'm running charts and questions simultaneously. I find that by digging in there and just getting into my head the whole structure of the storyline, then my second take is just reading it. And somehow on my second take, because I've done this, putting it in my head, I, I can see it come to, I can see it come alive more. And then obviously if I haven't already talked to the director, that's very much a part of my startup. I just, you know, just chatting and I don't wait for a meeting. I just pick up the phone and, and we talk about the piece and what we think it's about. How do you, uh approach your research uh, for the era. Nancy, give us a go on the research of the characters. I think this is a actually a piece of research you sent us here. Mute. There we go. <laughs> um, the research part of it, well, a lot of it depends on, I've done a lot of new operas. Uh, so a lot of the research has to do with the composer and the librettist. Um, and uh, I do a lot of reading in terms of, you know, whatever the subject line might be, if it's historically based or not. Um, and uh, research, where do I start the research or when do I start the research? 
um, as soon either, as I gather enough, one. yeah, as soon as I gather enough information, but a lot of it depends on um, the team that you're working with. Uh, you know, we have to kind of come together and talk about what we want to do. Is it going to be historically based? Is it going to be stylized historically based? Uh, you know, what, you know, there's so many ways to sort of go about it, but really you have to solidify that conceptual idea first. Um, and then you, you go to primary research, you know, depending on what time period you're looking at. Uh, we're looking at, you know, if you have if you can go back to photographs, which is like mid 19th century, or if you're looking at portraits or, you know, in books or whatever, um, you know, whatever is sort of related then to the conceptual idea. And also FIT has a, a great website as well um, that they sort of break down different um, decades of different centuries uh, and with a lot of uh, visual research. Yeah, it's called FIT uh, Fashion Timeline. It's really wonderful on the it website. It is wonderful. It's, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of really good information. Um, it's quite terrific. Um, yeah. One correction I wanted to make very quickly: Evan Evan is a costume production student. Oh, is he? <laughs> oh, I thought he was in costume design. He's in costume production. Yeah, oh, sorry. good. Okay. Off. Off. No, time. that's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, okay. Um, I would love to know a little bit, when I teach costume design, I teach um, about uh, the three, uh, three primary elements, color, line, and texture. And I always say every designer starts from one of those points either, and we all have our own process that starts differently. Penny, can you tell me which of those you start with first when you're designing? Well, in, in general, I start with line, unless the line's sort of already established. I feel like with something like Bridgerton, you sort of know the silhouette and the lines that are going to be there because they're kind of set in history in a way. So, but generally for me, I sort of start with line and silhouette. Um, and then, but from there, I, then I would go to probably color and texture and pattern and, and figure out what, you know, what things that inspire me that are around me that that talk to the emotion or the emote the quality that I'm looking for for each character or something like that. So uh, it's hard to it's hard to say. I think it sort of moves around depending on inspiration and what's what's around you, what you're looking at. You can be inspired by pebbles on a beach um, uh, and that can speak towards, you know, a, a character or a costume or something like that. So Mara. interesting, interesting, interesting question. Mara, can you pick this up with where you started when you uh, were working on the, um, the, the pieces that you sent us pictures for here? Mm, uh, well, I think it, it always depends on the project. But yeah, I think with, um, with the Regency shows, I, I would agree with Penny, right? The, the, the silhouette is very much dictated by the period, particularly if you're doing something that is like this was from the As You Like It that I did. And we did it very sort of strict period. Um, so then it really does become about color and texture and how that's reflecting character, um, particularly with this one where you have the fun of seeing, you know, Rosalind and Celia, the two court ladies, we see them first in the court and then in the country, in the forest and in Rosalind's case, going in disguise as a man. So you have the fun of kind of working with, you know, a female silhouette and a, and a male silhouette. Um, but I, I generally tend to be drawn very strongly to color. Um, that's kind of where my brain goes, particularly when I'm reading and kind of getting an emotional response to the characters. Nancy, you sent us a, a very intriguing opera. Um, <laughs> can you talk about how you started that process? Well, boy, I have to say, Burke and Hare, um, it's, it, it's, it's based on a real story of basically brave snatchers, uh, turn of the century, 19th century in Edinburgh. Um, and because it was new, uh, I did a lot of reading. I, of course, I read the libretto. Librettos can sometimes be sh a little bit on the short side. They give you a little bit of insight to it, but you need to do a lot of background information. Um, and so I did a lot of reading before I even started. I did it in the fall. I read, uh, you know, the thing is, one what what's wonderful about opera is that you get to really start it about a year out. So you have lots of time 
to do reading, do all the all the research that you need to do, or and or you know discussions with your team. Uh, we knew that it was rooted in history. It was a real story. So these people actually existed. Of course, what I could find of information about them uh, was somebody else's idea, like illustrative idea of what they look like. Uh, their books with their, you know, they they were in court and they drew them. Um, and so I based I based as much as I could on those sort of illustrations and what I could read uh, of it. Um, but they were quite, he was the doctor who was uh, uh, teaching uh, at this theater uh, at one of the teaching universities. And he was buying these cadavers from Burke and Hare who were um, at first exhuming graves, but then they started murdering people <laughs> because it was very lucrative. Um, so it was quite an, uh, it was quite a very, it was really, really interesting, written by Mark Campbell and Julian Grant. Uh, Mark has done, a, a, plethora of new operas. Um, he just came, I think, just before we did Burke and Hare, he did uh, The Shining. He was doing The Shining with Robert in, in uh, Colorado. So yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Can you talk, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but can you talk a little bit about this, this detail that's along the edge of the lapel and down the front of the tailcoat here? Mm -hmm. the, it's uh, Traditionally, it's a piece that's added um to the shape of the jacket and it has a series of button holes uh for buttoning up uh usually they're decorative uh but we see it in this particular time period we also see sometimes an m notch uh between the collar and uh the lapel right here maybe yeah. maybe not sometimes it's a little blank yeah. um but These jackets were never meant to close they are no. meant to stay open so because, because the waistcoats were made of very decorative usually decorative fabric and so you could see that yeah. beautiful waistcoat or a really beautiful wool or something yeah but. yeah and also it gave them that shape i mean they were wearing very narrow pants you know very shapely sort of uh costume. yes, yes. The pantaloons they yes at yes. the time the pantaloon was a very pant narrow pant we yeah. were just talking about how these pants are cut actually um and how we do them in the costume world and how they were done in the period and um uh penny maybe you might want to speak to that just a little bit <laughs> yeah oh yeah so you know i i work for, uh, primarily as a draper pattern maker and so oftentimes i have to do a heavy amount of they do research on images and i have to do research on pattern making so i understand how things were sort of put together in the time so i'm trying to follow along you know, obviously everything was hand sewn then, but we we're not hand sewing it today. But part of the patterning, you know, the pants tend to be very uh, droopy in the in the back side area, so they're not as attractive to a modern eye. Uh, so we have to make adjustments, you know, for for what what would be more aesthetically, you know, it depends. It depends on the designer. Some designers want to go period, like you know, no questions asked, you know, exactly how it was, and some people try to do a little more aesthetic, you know, turn on it. So yes yeah, so so the so the pants patterns are slightly different <laughs> i think for movability you know for for being able to ride a horse yes i think you're right i i'd love to um talk a little bit about the first sketching phase marianne you're such a an excellent artist could you talk a, a little bit about how you start sketching i think i have some these are some of mara's sketches i think this is one of um, Nancy's, and here we are with Mary Ann. Now I'm gonna get my mute off. Uh, so I, I would lead with saying that this particular production of Emma, I was hired very late on. Thank you, Susan Mickey. It was initially Susan's, <laughs> and, and and we had it, and there was a bit of a dosy. I'd forgotten girl. about that. Yeah, oh my yeah. God. Well, I have not because I had to crank. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to move very, very quickly to get ideas down on page. And, and what was significant about this script is really nobody left the stage long enough for there to be a significant change. So I had to quickly think through, like this one, an example is, you know, things to do to one dress to make you think it's not the same dress. I mean, everybody knows it's the same dress, but it's it's just trying to bring some transformation and change that fits its go with what's going on in the scene. 
And I did all of these, I did a full set of sketches in like two days because I just had to get ideas out. By the way, Mara, I just want to fess up. I do believe I used some of your costumes at Chicago. I think there were some of my, those men were dancing out. Sorry, I stole them directly <laughs> from your show. It's it's always good when we get to when we get to recycle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I recycled a lot because it was a scramble. And um and interestingly enough, the director led with I didn't send the initial roughs. Her first direction was she wanted no detail at all, none, and all the same fabric, and very 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 bright colors. Uh, none of which ended up being <laughs> achievable in the circumstances where we're in because the beauty of Bridgerton is the men, the mm. men in Bridgerton and the, and the ability to put all that color in there. So all of these I did, I moved really fast. And then I rendered them once I got the director off of bright colors into pastels, cause I just, I really didn't know how to support it without building the entire show. I got us into pastels. And then to be very honest, uh, and I'll leave this behind quickly, but uh, ultimately I, I got everybody to leave the pastels also. I, I could not find, the men had to all be rented and I couldn't find menswear that was gonna support it. So at the last minute, truly last second, we changed the entire palette to a lot of uh, variations on off-white ivory cream. Um, you can look at it, it's, there's a section of it out on YouTube, but the design stayed. So it's an evolution. And to me, once I get the sketches down, if I know the big path I'm on, I can change it. I can change anything. If I know the big ideas and the stories and the characters, then the evolution is actually kind of the best part. And it starts with the sketch. So we, we actually, sorry to jump in here. We actually have some fantastic questions coming in from the audience. Um, Let's hear them. The first one is from Morgan. Um, Morgan asks about um, historically based versus stylized based design, and if you could elaborate more on the difference. Who wants to take that? Mara, sure. I'll, you go. Well, I'll jump in and just in, in terms of talking about Bridgerton, because Bridgerton's a great example of a stylized approach, right? So when we're talking about traditional or more, um, Authentic is always such a tricky word in theater because we're like, like Penny was saying, we're always making um, adjustments. But like when you look at this image from Bridgerton that Susan has up, you know, the silhouettes by and large are very true to the period, but the fabric choices that um, Ellen Moroznik, is that how you say her name? Yeah. The, the costume designer um, is making are very stylized. These are not textiles on the women's gowns that we would typically be seeing in the Regency period, but she's doing it to great effect because those really bright acidic colors and bold florals are telling us a lot about the Featherington family, right? Versus all of the kind of icy cool pastels that we see um, the Bridgerton family wearing. Um, so it's about how much liberty you're taking with historical accuracy to create an emotional or visual context for the world. And, and what, you know, I look at these um, really uh, brilliant suit uh, tailcoats on the men, which would not have been these colors. And uh, I think, um, you know, this is a, a completely different world that she's creating. Right. Yeah, I would add the the mom in the yellow. Yes, uh, I think that's a. T it's also the performer dealing with the performer, their body type, what they're comfortable in. Uh, the sleeve on this dress is is not terribly Regency, well, but it's very elegant and stark on her, and lifts her silhouette out from the others. And I think it's great character storytelling. In addition to the fact that how are these guys getting into these pants? <laughs> I mean, there's hello. Well, so, there's probably a uh, yeah, the back or, or something, the, you know, a closure on the back. But I was also going to bring up the mother because the mother uh, consistently has a different silhouette, even though there's a long dress. Yes. But it's if you look at uh, her, what she's wearing in different scenes, it's very, very sort of form fitting uh, under the bust, which uh, in that time period is it usually falls straight from that from under the bust area. So hers are very curved in and yeah. show 
it shows yeah, she's shape. very curved in right here yeah and nipped in right under there yeah it's almost it's, like the 1960s it well, looks very 60s yeah I thought the same thing when I saw some of the the other patterns that they were using the color kind of combination and the patterns made me think 60s for sure and you know but but modern so in terms of um, the fabric choices, we have kind of a, a related question um, from Joyce, who was curious about your opinion on the trade-offs between authenticity of fabric choices, like using natural fiber fibers versus durability, maintenance, and any budget requirements. Uh, um, well, Using authentic, I mean, if you were to use authentic fabrics or fabrics that that um, were what they would have used then, I mean, they were using cottons and silks. Um, but what she's done here is to try to distinguish between the two families. Um, and if you look at the other family photo, we probably, we might not have one. Um, oh, they're very yeah. much of the time period in pastels and very light colors. This is a little earlier silhouette. But um, for instance, yeah, I mean, that's that. This is beautiful. Um, she probably would have had a sleeve in the time period, but you still have the silhouette of the time period. Um, it, I don't. It got sleeked up. I love how it got sleeked up, Nancy. It, did. it yeah. did. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. I mean, she really did try to use the fabrics that would distinguish, that would uh, personify the characters and the families visually, so that we. Uh, you know, totally understood when we see them side by side, what type of families they are. I think also just from like a practical standpoint and Susan, you were talking about this. There's also a big difference between what you're doing fabric selection wise for say TV or film than what you would be doing for on stage for opera or theater. Or Susan, you were talking about doing a production a Pride and Prejudice that was done outdoors. Yes. And so, there's a million practical considerations, particularly with theater where you're doing seven or eight performances a week yes. and the clothing has to take a different level of wear and tear than it does even on a film shoot. I mean, I, I remember reading on, um, uh, I can't remember the designer's name for Downton Abbey, but they were buying, you know, 1920s vintage dresses and chopping them apart to use the beading and all of the motifs. And A, you have the budget to do that, but also you can work with things that are more fragile because they don't have to have the same lifespan that, that a garment made for a theater or opera production or dance would, would do, so. Yeah. yeah, this production of Pride and Prejudice, they actually, um, the, the floor of the, the of the stage was almost like sandpaper. It had a, a, a texture to it, so it shredded anything that touched it, basically. And this was outdoors, so they had to be able to get drenched and dry out and, and withstand. Luckily, the director, Tyne Raffaelli, uh, really wanted them to look uh, muddy and used and worn and, and uh, very real. But it was, it was a, so you can see the, the hem is fairly mud stained on the petticoat uh, intentionally, but it was quite a, um, a challenge to put people in things and to have them dance with wild abandon and fall to the ground and do all of that kind of thing in this particular period. It's, it's really, um, it was really uh, difficult. So you can't use the very light frothy fabrics that you see in Bridgerton all the time um, because of the things that they're gonna to have to go through. Where I'd love to know a little bit, is there another question we need to answer before I move forward? Um, there, there are you know, a couple other questions, but I think we can filter them in as we keep going. I was just uh, wondering, since we're on the, the topic of fabric, if you all could tell us, where do you all find these very yummy fabrics and trims that we see in this era? They're quite delish. Who wants to go? Penny. Uh, it's funny, I worked at a fabric store in Boston for, for several years and there used to be 10 fabric stores in Boston, Massachusetts and now there's zero. Um, and so that's, that's actually a really interesting question because now fabric stores are sort of moving more online. And I think all of us would agree that going into a fabric store and touching fabrics and seeing 
seeing them and so much easier than that online um, search. Right now we go to New York um, and you also can do vintage markets. Some people use vintage markets to go through that. I don't know, Nancy, Mary, and Mara, what are your, what are your thoughts on those? I go to New York. We go to New yeah. York and you can get everything um, that you need. Yeah. There's so many different types of stores that, you know, um, and selling multiples. If you, whatever you want is there. Um, and I agree that it's it's really important to go in and look at the fabrics and feel the fabrics and it can, and sometimes it can inspire the design. So if you're yes. kind of floundering on something and you go and you, you, I'll just go into the fabric stores and see what I can find. And it could be inspiring, you know, for a particular design, whatever you might be doing. I find that that happens as well uh, because you get in there and you see all these gorgeous just beautiful. And I, I think what people might not realize is that many designers don't actually shop their own fabrics. They, they have shoppers and assistants who go to the store and shop for them and bring the, the swatches back to show and then the designer chooses them. And that, uh, especially on a big project like this, that would most, like Bridgerton, most likely that would happen. I'm, and I think you, the people in this room are some of the the few people who probably still love and do a lot of their own shopping. <laughs> Mary, well, I, I, I would add that I'm working on a, re, on a production of Christmas Carol right now that's from scratch, all build. And uh, because of COVID, I was not able to go to New York, which I, I'm so used to doing what I call a scout before I buy anything. I just wanna walk around and as Nancy said, let the fabrics talk to me. So it's interesting, I'm torturing my, my swatches way more than <laughs> normal. But what's also true is I'm having it, uh, it's what's important about knowing what fabrics do is the more knowledgeable you are, then the online is a more useful tool. But if you yeah. don't know your fabrics, the, the online can be very confusing. But right now I'm having it, I had it swatched at Osgood's in, um, mm -hmm. where is that? Springfield. Yeah, thank you. In Springfield, okay. I have it being swatched in Atlanta. What I love about Atlanta is, and I, on many projects, I've hired someone to swatch Atlanta for me. Uh, a lot of their um, upholstery houses are they very do. open and you can access yeah. their, um, and it's hard to get into those upholstery houses in other cities, in yeah. addition to New York, in addition to online. And I have, and I even have somebody looking for stuff for me just a little bit in Chicago. So you just want to see everything you possibly can before you pick so you know you've done your best. Mary, do you, do you stay in Chicago to shop or do you go afar? I usually go to New York. I mean, Chicago, like Boston, the number of stores has really diminished over years. And, and honestly, even New York, you know, is going through its own shift. Uh, I mean, it's still... New York and LA are still the best places in the US to shop. Um, it was interesting working at the Met even because for opera, they're often looking at not just buying for the initial set of costumes, but they're looking ahead knowing that they're gonna have to build replacements. Mm -hmm. And um, like the Met will use a lot of vendors over in Europe that they have huge swatch books like um, Fucatex, which is in Germany um uh what's the big one in london uh whaley's whaley's um, yeah. you know so it just depends on the project but if i can come to new york and swatch i love doing it i'm also very lucky that um one of my best friends is also a costume designer we were roommates in college and she works in primarily film and tv but when i can't come to new york she'll swatch for me and it's great having, you know, like for all of us, it's great having an, a, a swatcher who knows your style and your taste and what kind of fabrics you gravitate towards. So, uh, you know, so, all, all of the above, depending upon what you have the time and the money for. A swatcher for anybody who may, I'm sure most people might know, but is someone who you goes to the store for you and gathers snippets of all the fabrics they possibly can to bring back to you. And each swatch has, it tells you how much it is and where it comes from and um, yeah. any, any pertinent information about it. Marianne. I'll bet the swatching on Bridgerton could have probably filled three hampers. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? I, I will admit that for one costume build, I'll bet I look at 20, 30 samples for just that one. You know, and, and if there's more than one fabric in it, which there usually is, it's even more so can you imagine the stack 
that went that on with this thing? I used to have an uh, alum of our program when I was at the University of Texas who worked in a, a costume house in New York. And when they finished a show and, and packed up the swatches from it, they would send it to us because we had absolutely zero fabric stores in Austin, Texas. And it was such a, a wonderful gift to uh, for our students to have those swatches from uh, from a show that were left over. So um, Tracy, I'm gonna send it to you for another question. Yeah, so we have a question from Dana um, and she was wondering with elaborate costuming, how you negotiate the line of an actor wearing a beautiful costume versus a beautiful costume wearing an actor. <laughs> Good question. Good question. I, ha I have a actually, we could, this could, could segue into our fitting section and talking about fitting actors and the fact that an actor an actor is um, is always at the center of the decisions that you're making um, when you're doing things. Uh, Marianne, you like to talk about that. That's well, I, I firmly believe there's two places that what we do happens. One is the fitting room and the other is dress tech. And everything else, everything else for me is a prep for those two moments. So I would, I would, and I think appropriateness for the performer who's gonna wear the clothes is everything to me. And it's amazing with most, honestly, with most performers, you get them into a costume, you watch their body language in the mirror, you, you go up or you go down right there. And I did a fitting once in an airport. We rented a room in an airport because I was flying in, the actress was flying through, we brought everything out, we took over a room in the airport. And unfortunately, the first thing I did when I walked in the room, they'd already put her on the muslin, she was standing in the mirror, and the first thing I said was, wow, well, this isn't it. <laughs> and, and, and we started over. So. Uh, I, and I take movement very seriously. I really believe, with rare exception, I find that the clothes needs to support the performer's movement and needs. Every now and then you get one that's about the spectacle, uh, which is great, but I find that to be the exception, not the rule, so. This is, this is one fitting. You can see that the white on this is, the, is still the muslin or the lining, so the hem's not in it, but this is in the fitting and you can see us trying out the coat to see how it, this sort of, this coat sort of wore the actor a little bit, but he he was very good, so he could take it. <laughs> it was a I, have, bit. I think a lot of this also has to, and, and actually uh, Penny could probably um, back me up on this. A lot of uh, whether the actor is wearing the costume or the costume is wearing the actor has to do with the way it's made. Um, if, if, I yeah. mean, it used to be when I started out in theater, you would flatline everything with like heavy, almost like cotille. Now, yeah. I mean, some places still do this. I know the Met also, they, they flatline some things because of repetitive use or if, you know, they, it needs to last for a long time. They don't do that with everything. But in order for, I think, uh, an actress or a singer or a dancer to wear something that, um, to wear the costume and not have it overwhelm them has a lot to do with the, the types of materials and the way we look at it in the fitting and what they have to do. So it's a combination of things. What do you say, Penny? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we've sort of been practicing, uh, especially in the BU community, uh, every whenever we walk into the fitting, we're sort of walking into talking with the actor about what their needs are and what they're trying to, what they think their character is gonna portray. And we have to take that into huge consideration and comfortability. And you know, I, you know, in in my in my role at BU, I've sort of made sure that we're always making it a comfortable, open environment for them to talk about what what they're interested in doing. And it's a conversation. It's not it's not just about putting a pretty dress on somebody and say, now you're done and that's it. And and I think all the designers here would say that it's always like a, a morphing thing that has to happen. So yes, it's you know, you have to take into consideration the size of the actress, you know, is she, is she, is she tiny little thing? You can't put a big, you know, like, you know, all those things come into play and fit, you know, fit and comfortability yeah, and, and, yeah. and all that stuff. I totally agree. Uh, um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. What I think, um, 
when we look at Bridgerton, which was designed by New York native Ellen Morozhnik in the Regency period, um, I, I wondered how everybody um, reacts to the, those words, empire or empire dress, Regency period, and what those things mean. Um, the empire refers to the time that uh, Napoleon ruled. It was the Napoleonic empire. And uh, it was when the French were ruled by Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, it was in the late, seven, late 1789 to about 1900. But you know, fashion is really fluid. So you don't have those direct cutoffs. And then the Regency period is really 1811 to 1820, which was when King George III in Great Britain was still the king, but he had porphyria and he was um, had bouts of, of madness uh, based on that disease. And so his son, Prince Regent, George IV, um, would ruled for that period of time, thus called the Regency period. So when you all have designed in this period, what year have you gravitated towards the late 18th century or the early 19th century? Do you, um, how, how narrow is your window of design? Mara, because yours, your, yours look very, very peri highly period for that particular um, production that, that you, you sent us. Uh, which one, the, the Pride and Prejudice or the As You Like It? The as you. I yeah, I think that in that case, um, Gary Griffin, who was the director on that, who I've worked with a lot at Chicago Shakespeare, um, you know, and it's always interesting with Shakespeare because, right, you, there's so much um, openness about what period you set it in, but because that's a play that's about, um, you know, the, the central character, Rosalind, going in disguise as a man, and it's about a lot of... Um, the dynamics, the sort of uh, between the sexes. Um, he wanted a period that was where the delineation between male and female silhouette was really distinct. Um, and one of the things that we, you know, I think we were talking about the other day is that, you know, that on pier, that under the bus dress that has this almost nightgown like feel, there's something just ultra feminine about that. And it's also a period where I think in some ways it's a much more beautiful period for the men. Um, it's a tricky period for women because unless you're like very slender, if you're very bosomy or you're a fuller rounder figure, it can, it can very quickly become a not very attractive silhouette having the, the waistline right up under the bust. Um, but all the men, big, small, you know, like those, the pantaloons and the waistcoats and the high collars and the tailcoats are just, it's like a man in a tuxedo. They're just universally attractive. And so for the, as you like it, um, this one you have up is from the, the Pride and Prejudice I that I did, but. Um, is, that, is this one as you? This is as you, yeah, that's Rosalind and Celia. But it, it is, I think he was interested in a world where the girls were very girly girls. And then when we went into the forest and Rosalind is in disguise and we had that sort of outdoorsy hunting world, um, it leaned really into the masculine. Um, so yes, in this case, I would say we were, I was being pretty strict in terms of keeping close to period. But as with anything, like talking about movement, right? There are so many concessions we make um, or adjustments we make as costume designers. Um, we were talking about this the other day about how the corseting in Bridgerton is not actually true to the period, but it has a really sort of sexy look. Likewise, sometimes you'll do a period show but not do full on corseting because of what the actor needs to be able to do physically or what the director wants them to be, be able to do. So depends on depends on the project and what the requirements are yeah the men of this period were called um incroyable and the, the incredibles and the women were merveilleuses or marvelous women and those were the fashionable aristocratic subculture in paris at the time during the uh, directoire period and into regency um can you talk about how you've approached the men's clothing for this, Penny? <laughs> I just unmute for a minute and turn my car off. Um, 
as far as building it uh, uh, and fitting it, it again, like it goes back to what the aesthetic is and what you're doing. Um, you know what what the needs of the what the needs of the piece are for that piece in specific. Um, uh, there's a lot of tailoring that, that this is like the birthplace, I think, of modern tailoring in a way. I think Nancy could speak to that as well. It's sort of like what they started to do those turn back collars and stuff like that, and that sort of bow brummel comes out of this time period. You know that very fancy. Um, you know, fancy lad type man. Um, and so they're, they're still kind of peacocky in a way men at this time period, they have a lot of fancy pieces going on. And so uh, they're just as they're just as uh, delightful as the women in some ways, as far as the materials and the and the structures that go into them. Can um, Marianne, you talk about what are some of the main hurdles when it, it does come to um, uh, deciding which sil silhouette to use and people wearing this these clothes? Uh, I tend to, well, first of all, I would love to do 1800. I love the softness. It's just the start of all that uh, Regency pomp here, but it's really hard to wear. It's, um, it doesn't show the figure as much. And, you know, they used to dampen those muslins so that they cling to their bodies. So I tend to, and, and actually, if you're looking at all of us, we're all working roughly 1810, 1815, 17, because you start to see a little structure come into the Empire. They start to control where the fabric is gathered or not gathered. Uh, and, and it allows you to kind of shop back a little bit if you want to get softer on one or a little uh, more structured on another. So I tend to, especially since I, I always get a show with a, a whole range of body sizes, thank goodness, because I think it'd be boring otherwise. So I, I tend to work 18, if this is my period I'm in, and I've done this a couple of times now, a couple, a couple three, I tend to go there. I feel like it gives me license to go forward a bit, fall back a bit, but I don't consider my work to be, you know, documentary. I, I, it's, uh, it's putty in my hands to mold to the performer for the character for the story. Uh, but I, I've, I've always steered clear of the turn of that century much as I love it, it's just a little too much fabric to control on the stage. Hey, Susan, can you pull up that first image you have of uh, Queen Charlotte? Because I think that's also super interesting. Yeah, I love it. Because that. there's a choice that they're making, right? That her silhouette is going back to like the 1780s. It's like, you know, it's that thing where it's like you found you found your groove, right? We're, we're much more closer to like the Watteau back and the Panier dresses. And it's like she found her style jam and she's sticking with it. Yes. Right. And, and she's signaling the old guard. She's saying right. we, we are the the um, the, the old fashioned uh, way of being different and generation, different generation. And, and, and all of her ladies of, of, are of that generation. And I love how it changed. It just fills the screen. I mean, it just becomes this massive, deliberate presence. It, it, they, it, they're architectural. They become as much of the scenery as they are the characters. And I love that about that choice. And every time, every time she has a scene, I think with Queen Charlotte, her whole entourage is dressed in in color coordinating ensembles, as I remember. They they look like furniture. <laughs> I know. It's like they're they're her backup girls, right? I mean, and that's right. where it had like this could be a Beyonce video, right? And <laughs> and that volume that she takes up versus that very columnar um, pure dress is such a like she. It's a great way of using volume and silhouette to tell a story. Right? Power. 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 <laughs> power. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty powerful. Tracy, do you have another question for us? I do, sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> um, I do, I have a question from Denise um, asking if you could speak to the difference between film design and stage design. Who wants to take that? Mary Ann, you've done film and stage. Yes, I have. And I, I quite, I love all of them, I must admit. It's, it's about composition and scale. I, I don't know how else to put it. It's, it's a, what the eye of the camera sees 
and and real conversations with the DP. A lot of a lot of film stuff actually gets storyboarded, so you get a sense of what you're going to see in a given scene. Am I going to? Is this going to be a close up? Am I going to see a head to toe here? Uh, I like to know some of that. I mean, it can change on a dime on the day of the shoot. It can all it can all change immediately. Um, but how the camera sees color, how the camera sees detail, you get to work. I love working film because I get to work smaller and I don't worry about it, you know, if the last row is going to see it. Um, but then I, but I equally love on the, what I love about theater is having to work the whole composition all the time that the composition of the of the proscenium or the stage space is a given at all moments. And we're, we're always seeing head to toe and always seeing somebody next to somebody else if there's more than one people person on the stage. So for me, it's about scale, composition, and then, and then your palette control. What I love about Bridgerton is it's, there's no doubt every single scene has its own palette. Every single scene is completely controlled for palette, scale, composition, detail, you know, and it's all beautifully controlled. I mean, this is a really good example. There's a similar scale on all the trims and how they're used. And yet there's no question who's in charge. And they flipped it. Normally you'd say, oh, I'm gonna put, you know, normally white takes all the focus, but the control here is such that no, no, She's got the color and and scenery and uh, props supported her with the repetition of that rose in the chair. So it's, it's, it's a different scale and thinking compositionally, I think is different for me when it's this one or that one. I love both of them. And, and I think it it's, it's different right at this moment because a lot of the film work is being seen on people's personal televisions and not on a big screen. And uh, a television reduces that scale down in a different way. So that makes for you know a, a whole different way of, of looking at it. Um, but it but it's still the camera still has the ability to see a close up and more um, minute detail than we can see in theater unless you're on the front row in a small in a small space. Well, and digital film has changed the game also a lot. It's, I mean, you know, because I did film and I did video stuff and, but this is what that camera sees now is amazing. Digital and, film is almost molecular. It just sees yeah, absolutely It sees everything. better than the human eye. Yes, yes. I was gonna say it was, um, one of the things that's also been really interesting is the advent of like HD broadcasting. And so like with the, with the operas at the Met, you're designing for a 4,000 seat opera house, but you also know that your things are going to be seen on a movie screen in ultra, ultra detail. And that's, that's also, I think, especially now since the pandemic, like that's going to be an interesting to, thing to see how that evolves in terms of does more and more theater work also get archivally recorded and in a way you're ending up sort of designing for two mediums, you know? I think you're totally right. And I think that's absolutely where it's going. The opportunity to reach out to more audience with your work, you know, for people who can't get to the theater, I would be very surprised if that's not part of the future. And yeah, yeah we're gonna have to be able to do both. I just saw a question come in say, asking if anybody was ever tempted to try on the costumes that you're working on. <laughs> Oh, I'll take that one. When I'm working on all rental things, everything gets tried on by somebody. My assistant, the draper, doesn't matter. I don't believe in hang or appeal. It's like, what is this thing like on? And I'll bet everyone here is, would, does the exact same thing. I put them on forms. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you do I use dress forms. Uh, you, I use dress forms a whole lot, but I also I also try some things on just to see how it if it if it work you know if you can move in it or how it might work. I'm a sucker for a big swooshy great coat. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I'll always try on a big great coat and walk around in it. That's that's fun. One last uh, question I have um, because everything that we see and take in. Um, through our eyes and brain influences our design. I always say your, your creativity is, is a 
um, a muscle and it, it has to be, or it's a, it's something that has to be fed and you feed it by the things you look at and the things you experience. So as we have all experienced Bridgerton, how will seeing this design as they all do affect your next design in this period? Let's start, let's start with Nancy. Well, it kind of gives you, I don't know, I, what I love about it is how bold it is and it, it, it allows you to, it just gives you, I don't know what I'm trying to say, is it gives you uh, the liberty to kind of do that sort of thing, not to, to be bold and not to, to feel like you always have to stick to historically accurate. I mean, she is, she does ground it in the period, but she goes beyond that. And it's nice that, you know, and it's so effective that it shows people it can be done, that you can do it, that it's okay, <laughs> you know. Um, that's what I would say. Yeah, Penny. Yeah, I was gonna say like the, the favorite which came out earlier, I don't, I don't know if everyone remembers that one, but it's a similar thing where they kind of like, you know, I think we get sort of, we got bogged down for a while with always staying within the period. And this sort of shows you like, we're not trying to, you know, recreate, you know, history. We can take from it and sort of adapt it and make it make it different and more beautiful and have our own, you know, how would we do it if we were, you know, doing it, if we were living then, now, all that stuff. So I, yeah, I completely agree with Nancy. It gives us free, it sort of shows that there's a liberty there that you can take. Marianne. Well, they have covered it brilliantly. So I would just say, I want more money. <laughs> I yeah, want, that's what you said I, yesterday. You I, wish you had that budget. I want this budget. <laughs> well, if we're going to dream big, but I yeah. believe that Nancy and Penny have covered it very clearly. Yeah. And now, now everybody's been introduced to this. If you realize how many people have seen this, it's like back in the 70s and 80s when the BBC started to do period clothes that was perfect period clothes. You start to, you know, people start to be more informed. You're, you're giving them information. So yeah, uh, show me the money. Mara, what do you say? Oh, I think for me, the thing that's so inspiring about this is, is the same thing that I found really inspiring about, about Hamilton. And it's about, it's about representation and seeing these period garments, not just on white bodies. And particularly, I think one of the things that's super strong in, in Bridgerton is the hair and the way that we're seeing natural hair texture worked into period hairstyles, but it's not about trying to straighten or adapt to a white lens of what is beautiful. Um, and I think it's just really exciting. It makes it more expansive. Um, so I think that that's the thing that, that I find really inspiring about, about the work on this show. Yes, I agree. Well, this has been an absolutely wonderful discussion. I so appreciate um, our fantastic speakers and all of the audience members who are here joining us today. Um, as a reminder, if you weren't able to view this webinar in its entirety, it will soon be available on the Boston University Alumni Association website. Um, Tracy, do you have any last words for us? Uh, I, I don't, I just, it, what a fantastic conversation. Thank you to all of you. Thank everyone again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Go watch a period costume drama right now and think of us. Take care. Thanks, Susan. Thank Thanks, you all. Tracy. Bye.